this uh, part of the week is, of course, uh, Parsha Shmini. Uh, let me go over a little bit of the chronology of this period, because sometimes it's a little confusing. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with the second luchos, the second tablets on Yom Kippur. Right? That is when God forgave us for the sin of the golden calf. The day after Yom Kippur, Moshe gathers all the people and talks about a mishkan and calls upon them to contribute to the Melech HaSamishkan. So what is called the Melech HaSamishkan, the contribution and the construction, uh, led, of course, by the great architect Betzalel, who was a young man of 13. Uh, did, you, did you learn that? Betzalel was only 13 years old, and he's running the whole, uh, the whole show with uh, not only with consummate skill, but uh, even prophecy that, in some levels, is greater than Moshe's. Betzalel understood certain details that even Moshe didn't understand. So the Mishkan was being formed and constructed from the day after Yom Kippur. And according to Chazal, you don't see this in the Chumash, it was actually completed in the month of Kislev. So it would be Tishrei, Cheshvan, Kislev. And it should have been erected and dedicated in the month of Kislev. But God wanted to defer its dedication to the month of Nisan, because Nisan is the anniversary of the Exodus, and it's also the birthday of Yitzchak, who is the pillar of divine service. And therefore, Hashem delayed or deferred Hakamas HaMishkan from Kislev to Nisan. So the Medrash tells us that Kislev was very upset because Kislev was deprived of the opportunity of being the dedication. So as you can probably guess at this point, Hashem promised Kislev, I'll make it up to you, that in the future, during the second temple, during the Hanukkah story, uh, the temple is going to be rededicated in Kislev. Okay, so what then happens is that uh, the Mishkan is ready, but it's not, it's not set up yet. Uh, it gets set up. Now, if you remember last week's Parsha, there were seven preliminary days before the day of dedication itself. Uh, and these are called the seven days of Miluim, of consecration. During those seven days, Moshe Rabbeinu put the Mishkan up and took it down every single day. That's an enormous uh, feat of even physical strength. Put the whole Mishkan up, took it down for seven days. And during those seven days, and this is the only period where this was true, Moshe Rabbeinu was actually the Kohen. Moshe brought the Korbanos for those seven days. And each of those seven days, uh, Aaron and his four sons would be, he would dress them with the big day kahuna, he would anoint them with the Shem and Hamishcha, the special olive oil. He would bring korbanos on their behalf and sprinkle the blood not only on the altar, but also on them. And this was called consecration. He was kind of preparing the Kohanim to assume their task. And that was for seven days. And for those seven days, Aaron and his four sons had to essentially sleep in the area of the Mishkan. They were not allowed to go home. They were told not to leave that area for seven uh, days. We then have the eighth day, where, which is the beginning of our parsha, Vahibi Amashmini, was the eighth day. So at this point, Aaron takes over. Aaron and his sons take over, and they become the Kohanim. And from now on, all of the avoda of the korbanos are going to be done by Aaron. Now, there's a big machlokas rishonim, which is ultimately based on a machlokas midrashim. What's the chronology here? Because we know from Parshas uh, Pekude, at the end of Sefer Shmos, that the Mishkan was erected Rosh Chodesh Nisan. We know that. We don't know that from this Parsha, but we know that from Pekude, the Mishkan was erected Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So the question is, what does that mean? Does that mean that was the start of the seven days of consecration? Which would mean that the eighth day of our Parsha would be the eighth of Nisan? In other words, the Shivas Yumei HaMiluim began Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And from Rosh Chodesh Nisan onward, Moshe put up the Mishkan and took it down for seven days. And the eighth day is the eighth of Nisan. Or do we say the other way around? 
the seven days of consecration began the 23rd of Adar. And the eighth day is Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Not the eighth of Nisan, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Now Rashi learns consistently throughout, both, both here and throughout the whole Torah, that uh, the seven days of consecration were the last week of Adar, and Rosh Chodesh Nisan was the day that the Mishkan was dedicated. That also means it was the day that Aaron's two sons, none of any of you died, because they died on this eighth day. And uh, that is the mainstream view of Chazal. The Ibn Ezra, however, uh, takes the position that the seven days of Miloim began Rosh Chodesh Nisan, and therefore the eighth day is the eighth of Nisan. Right? So we have a machlokas. According to Rashi, the eighth day is, is Rosh Chodesh Nisan. According to the Eben Ezra, the eighth day is the eighth of Nisan. Now, although Rashi's opinion is the mainstream view of, of Chazal, uh, the Eben Ezra does have one interesting uh, Chazal that supports his view. And that is, do you remember, obviously, this is Nisan, right? Whether it's the first of Nisan or the eighth of Nisan, but it's Nisan. So a short while after this, the Jewish people are going to bring the Korban Pesach. Right, the first carbon Pesach in the desert, actually the only carbon Pesach in the desert, right? You know, we brought the carbon Pesach in Mitzrayim, and we bring it the first year in the desert, and the next time we bring the carbon Pesach is going to be 40 years later, in the time of Yehoshua. There was no other carbon Pesach that was brought in the desert other than this first one. But this first one is going to be brought shortly after the dedication of the Mishkan, whether the Mishkan is dedicated the first of Nisan, so it'll be two weeks later, or it's dedicated the eighth of Nisan, so it'll be a week later, but it's going to be very soon. Now, you'll then recall that there were people who were tummy. They were uh, contaminated by dead body, and therefore they couldn't bring the Korban Pesach. So they went to Moshe Rabbeinu, and they asked Moshe Rabbeinu, what shall we do? if we're not able to bring the Korban Pesach. And Moshe didn't know the halacha, and Moshe asked God. So you'll recall that the answer that was given is, for people who are Tomei, they are given a chance to bring the Korban Pesach a month later, which is the 14th of year. This is called Pesach Sheni. So far, so good. The Gemara discusses, why were these people Tomei? What was the cause for them being Tomei? So the Gemara gives two possibilities of why these people were Tameh. One possibility is that throughout the wanderings of the desert, we were carrying the bones of Yosef to bury him in Mitzrayim. And uh, it was rotation. Different people had different rotations. And these people happened to be Tameh because the week of the Korban Pesach, it was their turn to carry Atzmos Yosef. So they were Tameh. That's one pshat. But there's another pshat in the Gemara that these were Tomei because they were the Levium who had to carry out the dead bodies of Nadav and Avihu who died on the day that the Mishkan was dedicated. Right? The Torah says there were two Levium, their cousins actually, who had to carry out the bodies of Nadav and Avihu. They became Tomei and therefore they couldn't bring the carbon Pesach. Now, let's think about this in terms of chronology. When you are in contact with a dead body, you are Tame for seven days. After the seven days, well, well, on the third day, you get sprinkled with the Paraduma ashes. On the seventh day, you get sprinkled with the Paraduma ashes. You go to the mikvah on day seven, and after Shkia, or after Tzesa Kochavim, after the stars come out, you're pure. Now, according to Rashi, if they, if not of an Aviyu died, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, then why would, why would the Leviyim be Tameh when you bring the Korban Pesach? You bring the Korban Pesach on the 14th of Nisan. But like the Eben Ezra, it actually fits very well. Because if not of an Aviyu died on the 8th of Nisan, so the 8th is day 1, that's the first day that they became Tameh. So 8th, Right, is day one, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That means Erev Pesach was still the seventh day 
from their contact with the dead body. As a result, they were still tummy until nightfall. They were not able to bring the carbon Pesach. So the fact that Chazal have an opinion that the need for Pesach Sheni was because of people who became tame because they carried out none of and never used bodies, that would be a raya, that would be a proof to the Eben Ezra's Yisot that indeed the, de the, the dedication of the Mishkan was on the 8th of Nisan and none of and who died on the 8th of Nisan and that is when the Levian became tame. Apparently, Rashi, who takes the position it happened on the 1st of Nisan, would have to be following the other opinion in the Gemara that the reason they were tummy is because they were carrying Yosef's bones. So whatever happened the first of these is not relevant, but within a week before Pesach, they were carrying Yosef's bones, so they became tummy. But the Mandi Amar, that it was not of an Aviyu that made them tummy, that only works with the Eben Ezra. Okay, so again, it's a chronological point that uh, for those who like chronology is, is, is actually a very interesting point in which apparently Chazal had a machlokas, how to reconstruct the exact chronology. Either way, though, either way, it is important to recognize that the day of dedication in the Torah is described as the eighth day. Whether it's the eighth of Nisan or the first of Nisan is not relevant, but it is the eighth day coming after the seven days of consecration. So, Hakamas HaMishkan is identified as the eighth day. That's the Parsha. Eight is a very important symbolic number in Judaism. God made the world in six days, and then he rested on Shabbos. So seven represents the world of nature, albeit lifted to a spiritual apex. Because after you have six days culminated by a Shabbos, what then happens? You start the cycle over again. So seven is a complete cycle within the world of nature that we live in. Yes, it's true that Shabbos is way above the other six days, but Shabbos is still bound to the cycle of the natural order. When we talk about the eighth day, in fact, even in English, it's an, actually an expression that connotes this. Uh, the eighth day refers to a type of relationship to God that transcends nature, that goes beyond logic, that is not subject to the boundaries, to the finiteness of time and space. That is why eight is a fairly important number in Judaism. The most obvious example is why is bris mila? Why is circumcision on the eighth day? And one of the reasons is because God's relationship to the Jewish people transcends nature. It is a miraculous relationship. It is supernatural. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it's absurd. I don't mean absurd in the sense of being foolish, but absurd means it's nonsensical, meaning it does not fit any logical construct that we ought to be around after the Greeks and the Romans and all of the greatest empires of the ancient, of the ancient world, and then the later the Nazis, whatever it would be, and even today, enemies want to destroy us. And yet we're still around. And it's not, and it's not just we're still around like we're, you know, we're in caves in Afghanistan or whatever it is, but flourishing, contributing, being significant. You know, if you ask many non-Jews, uh, what percentage of the world's population is Jewish? How many Jews are there in the world? So they're going to say, oh, 50%, must be 40%. Like everywhere I turn, there's Jews and Jews and Jews. They control everything. Jews are less than 1%, right? Is that correct? Less than 1% of the... 0.5. What? 0, 0. 0.5. Oh, 0. 0.5. So it's a half percent, a half percent of the population. So you see, uh, it's an amazing thing. Apparently, uh, we deliver a, a lot of bang for the buck, so to speak, meaning numerically, we're very, very insignificant. But our contribution to the world is enormous. In fact, even our contribution for bad is enormous. You know, we invented communism, you know, <laughs> all, those, all that stuff. But the point is, Jews, you know, make a splash. And it makes no sense. It's way out of proportion to our numbers. Again, I don't want to get into... Uh, 
Jewish boasting, you know, that, that's unseemly, like, you know, how many Nobel, Nobel Prizes, okay, whatever it is. Uh, but here is the thing. There was a British historian, Arnold Toynbee, who was very popular in the 40s, 50s, 60s, a brilliant uh, British historian. And he wrote a multi-volume work called A Study of History. And what Toynbee proposed to do was he wanted to analyze 50 ancient civilizations, going all the way back, Babylonians, Sumerians, Assyrians, Hittites, Assyrians, all the way to Greek and Roman, because that's the end of what's called the ancient world, plus the Jews. And he wanted to see if he could identify common denominators that are responsible for the rise of a civilization or the fall of a civilization. Imagine how much data he would have to amass and master. And um, he managed, his thesis was, he was able to identify the factors that cause civilizations to succeed and the factors that cause civilizations to fail. And this explains 49 out of the 50 civilizations that he studied. But the problem was it didn't fit the Jewish people because the Jewish people didn't have a lot of the things that are supposed to guarantee survival. For most of our history, we weren't on our land. We didn't have territory. Uh, for most of our history, many Jews did not speak Hebrew. We didn't have a common language. A lot of the factors, we didn't have an army, you know, we didn't have all of those things that are normally a sign of a stable civilization. Now, it is said, well, actually, it's, it's a known fact that Toynbee had a certain anti-Semitic streak in him. But, you know, I don't know if I can blame him. I mean, if I did a 10,000-page book and uh, everything fits perfectly, but those Jewish people refute my thesis, I would be upset too. Hey, you know, get out of the way, you know, my book. Let my book uh, be true, as it were. So Toynbee coined the phrase that was infamous at the time that the Jews are a fossilized people. In other words, his argument was they really shouldn't exist at all. It's like going into the forest and finding a fossil of a dinosaur or something, meaning you know, we don't belong in the world, actually, because we don't make sense. And that was treated itself as an anti-Semitic remark, and there was big debates all over the place. Uh, there was a man, Yaakov Herzog, who was the uh, uncle of the president of Israel. Uh, he was the son of Chief Rabbi Yitzchak, right? The president of Israel is the grandson of the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, Rav Yitzchak Herzog. Rav Cook was not chief rabbi of the state of Israel. Rav Cook died in the 1930s before there was a state of Israel. So the first chief rabbi of Medinat Yisrael, Ashkenazic chief rabbi, was a brilliant, brilliant uh, Talmud Chacham and legal scholar generally, Rav Yitzchak Herzog. And Rav Yitzchak Herzog had you know, a number of children, but one of his children was Yaakov Herzog, who was also a from person and a Talmud Chacham. Uh, but for a while, he was Israel's ambassador to the UN. And he was an intellectual and a very good speaker. So on American college campuses, he was debating, or even in England, he was debating Toynbee, are the Jews a fossilized people, right? So this is called the Herzog Toynbee debate, and you can actually go to YouTube and you can get uh, some videos of the Herzog Toynbee debate. Of course, it's not the same quality as the videos of today, but it you know, goes back to the 19, 1960s. So Herzog, I'm sorry, Toynbee was arguing, hey, the Jews are just a fossil, okay? Uh, Herzog was arguing, no, they're vibrant, uh, etc. But here is the thing I would want to suggest. If, 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 by, if by the use of the term fossil, Toynbee means that under the laws of history, there ought not to be a Jewish people, I would say Toynbee is correct. That's exactly the point. The relationship of God to the Jewish people is supernatural. It is above history. It does not fit the paradigm of historical causality. Many things can be analyzed in terms of the normal processes of history, sociology, how cultures develop, and Toynbee may have been correct. 
cultures develop a certain way and they disintegrate a certain way. That's fine. That'll be true for the Babylonians, and that'll be true for the Egyptians, and that'll be true for the Assyrians, and that'll be true for the Greeks, and that'll be true for the Romans. But none of that holds true for the Jewish people. And that is why bris mila is connected to the number eight. God's covenant with us is above and beyond the natural order of things. Um, so that's why a bris mila is uh, the eighth a day. That's also why on Yom Kippur, when the Kohen Gadol goes into the Kodesh Akdashim, the Holy of Holies, and he sprinkles the blood, so you will know, remember that he makes, he sprinkles the blood eight times. One with an upward motion, seven with a downward motion. But once again, why is it connected to eight? Because the divine forgiveness of tshuva is also a miraculous process. The same way if I murder somebody, all of my contrition is not gonna bring him back to life. If I murder my soul by sin, we don't look at it that way, but in reality, that, that is a real phenomenon. How can it be restored? It's dead. It's destroyed. Tshuva is a miracle. Tshuva is techias amesim. Tshuva is something that's above nature. It is a resurrection of the dead, and that's why it too is connected to the number eight, right? The idea of lamala min hateva, and that is why the dedication of the Beis HaMikdash, or the Mishkan, the dedication of the Mishkan, is on the eighth day, because the eighth day, too, signifies above nature, that God resting his divine presence in a physical earth is something that is not logical. Let me just go back a little bit about the Jewish survivability as a miracle. Rav Yaakov Emden writes, you know, people always say, you know, why doesn't God do miracles today. If only God would do a miracle, I would believe in him. Yavak of Emden says, if you contemplate the survival and the flourishing of the Jewish people, despite all the persecutions, that is a greater miracle, he says, a greater miracle than the 10 plagues and the splitting of the Red Sea. Jewish survivability is the greatest possible miracle that one could imagine. We take it for granted, but it truly is an amazing thing. And this is the idea of being Lamala Minateva. So this was a great day, the day that the Mishkan is being dedicated. And imagine the altar is erected and fire comes down from heaven and consumes the Korbanos. Tremendous day. And yet it turns out that this day was mired in tragedy. Aaron lost two of his sons, his two oldest sons that day, because they brought a foreign fire, very obscure. They brought a foreign fire before God, and therefore a fire came from the Almighty and consumed them the way the Gemara explains it, the fire, the divine fire, entered their nostrils and consumed them from within, meaning to say their bodies were not disfigured. Their bodies externally were intact, but the neshama was reclaimed, so to speak. But be it as it may, these were the tragic deaths of Nadav and Avil. And how does the Torah describe Aaron's reaction? Vayidom Aharon. Aaron was silent. Aaron said nothing. So there is a machlokas exactly. How do you learn Vayidom Aaron? The standard interpretation is that Aaron was so righteous that he accepted the divine decree without complaining without screaming, without crying, without saying to God, how can you do it? Vayidaim, I accept. Whatever God does is righteous and good, even if I don't understand it. That's, I think, the normal way that's interpreted. There is another way of interpreting it, 
which uh, is that he was so consumed with grief, he was just paralyzed. He was not even able to express anything. I actually saw this I, I, um, when a, uh, a child, this was uh, 15 years ago, a long time ago, before, before this war, um, a child of some friends of mine, actually the child was a friend of my own son, was brutally murdered uh, by terrorists in Tekoa. Uh, the parents who, had, who did have other children, but the parents were so overwhelmed with grief, they could not even talk, they could barely breathe, they couldn't even breathe, taking a breath. It took an actual conscious effort. So you can learn two pshatim in Vayid Omaran. Was it the unconditional acceptance of God? Or was it the notion of being crushed by grief? Be it as it may, however, there is a follow-up series of commandments that after Nadav and Avihu died, Aaron and his sons are commanded not to observe the mourning rituals that you normally would. They were told, do not let your hair grow long, do not rip your garments. Now there's, there was a concept you know, to, I don't want to trivialize, the show must go on, meaning this is the day of the vacation of the Mishkan. Yeah, you lost your two children, but today you're not going to mourn. In fact, that's kind of one of the halakhic sources why we do not observe mourning. The laws of Shiva, we don't observe mourning on Shabbos or Yom Tif, Because when days are festive and holy to God, we don't mar them with sadness, even though tragedies can happen on Shabbos and Yom Tif too. But we don't mourn. But they, they tell you, I mean, I'm sure there are numerous stories like this, but they say about uh, Godel, I think it was the Nitziv, that a daughter of his died and he got the news on Shabbos. And this was a child that he loved very, very much. And, you know, the family was breaking down in all sorts of ways. And the Nitziv said, it's Shabbos, it's Shabbos, we don't mourn on Shabbos. And the Nitziv, you know, continued Zemiros and Torah, and everything else, not a single, if you would have seen him, uh, you would not know that anything happened. But towards the end of the day, he kept on looking at the clock. And he kept on asking people, are there three stars in the sky yet? Because Shabbos is officially over when there are three stars in the sky. We work with clocks. We say 45 minutes, whatever it is. But the official end of Shabbos is when you can see three stars in the, in the sky. And he kept on asking. And when they finally told him there were three stars in the sky, he immediately broke down into uncontrollable wailing. Meaning he had been holding in these emotions the whole time. So you didn't even know he was feeling anything. And then when he let go. So it just shows you what our, our righteous person is in such control of himself that when the Torah says rejoice, he rejoices, and he doesn't express any sadness. They say by Purim, the other way around, Rabbi Saul Salanter, he used to get very drunk on Purim. But of course, when he got drunk, he would say Torah and all sorts of things. Uh, but when it was towards the end of Purim, and they told him uh, Purim is over, he became sober immediately. <laughs> he, just, he got out of it. He was in a state of intoxication, because on Purim, he's supposed to be a shikar a little bit, after Purim, a Jew is not supposed to be sugar when it's not Purim. So somehow he was able, had such mastery over himself that he was drunk on Purim and then he got undrunk right after Purim. Like as soon as the stars were out, uh, he became immediately, immediately sober. The notion of the mind controlling the body instead of the body controlling, controlling the mind. So what was the sin of Nadav and Aviyu, right? What did Nadav and Aviyu do wrong? It's very enigmatic. Now the Torah says they brought a strange fire to God that God did not command. So in Pashat Pshat, what that means is the following. They were going to bring incense. Now the incense, the coals from which you burn the incense, Right, the incense is not burned on the outer altar, right? The big Mizbeach, where you bring korbanos, is in the courtyard of the Mishkan. In the Mishkan building itself is a smaller golden altar that you bring ketores, you bring incense. 
But when you bring the incense, you take coals, burning coals, from the big fire on the big Mizbeach, and you bring it into the Mishkan to burn on the golden Mizbeach. Now, those coals are supposed to be taken from the Mizbeach, which is the fire that came from heaven. They decided to add their own fire. They wanted to bring their own contribution. So they brought their coals from the outside. That is called a foreign fire. So God destroyed them because they took in a foreign fire. Right? That's the Pashat Pshat, meaning they didn't uh, exclusively use the sanctified fire from the altar. But Chazal, and Rashi brings some of these, Chazal bring a number of other things that none of and you did. So I just want to give you a quick catalog of what these things are. And we'll try to see if there's a common denominator in, in all of them. Uh, the first one that Rashi brings is that they drank wine or something intoxicating before they entered the Mishkan. And the halacha is a Kohen who drinks wine I don't mean he get drunk, even if you drink a revius of wine. A revius of wine is only four fluid ounces. Not that much. Uh, but a Kohen who drinks a revius of wine is not allowed to enter the Beis HaMikdash until he sleeps a half an hour uh, or the like. And therefore, they were high of Misa because they entered the Mishkan in a state of halachic, not actual intoxication, but in a state of what is called halachic, intoxication. The proof that Rashi brings is a very difficult proof, and he, but his proof is because right after they died, God gave the warning, do not drink wine when you go to the Mishkan. Now, there's a big problem with this interpretation because this is what the U.S. Constitution calls an ex post facto law. What is an ex post facto law? A law that tries to punish you for something you did before the law was passed. I mean, I mean you, you, if you do something on Monday and then we pass a law on Tuesday that is illegal, we can punish people who violate that law on Wednesday. But I can't punish people who violate, violate law on Monday because on Monday there was no law, right? In fact, the Constitution of the United States specifically says that Congress cannot pass a law to punish people for anything they did before that law was passed. That's very logical. That's called ex post facto law. Well, this seems to be an exact example of ex post facto law. None of an EVU dies because they drank wine, but the prohibition against drinking wine was given after none of an EVU died. So how could they be punished for a halacha that did not come into communicated existence till after they were punished for it? The answer has to be, apparently, the answer has to be that even though the law was not given, but on their, on their spiritual madrega, they should have understood it. Meaning, essentially, they didn't get punished because they violated an actual prohibition, but they got punished because according to their greatness and their righteousness, they should have understood that it is not appropriate to enter the sanctuary when you're in a little bit of a state of even partial intoxication, which is an interesting idea that righteous people can be punished uh, even if they didn't technically violate the halacha because they should have lived by a higher standard than uh, they, they did. They were not living at the standard that Hashem expected of them. So that's shot number one. They drank wine. Shot number two is they didn't get married. They decided, Lahabdil, like a Catholic priest, that they would be holier if they remained celibate, and therefore they remained uh, separated from women. And even though they thought this enhanced their holiness, in fact, celibacy, well, until you find your shidduch, so God excuses you because you, know, you don't have a wife yet. But to deliberately decide, I want to be celibate, I don't want to be married, is a big avera. Now, it is interesting. There is one Yotze Minaklal, and that is Moshe Rabbeinu himself, who was married and had children from Matan Torah onwards. The rest of his life, Moshe was celibate. And maybe that's why Nadav and Aviyah were trying to emulate Moshe's model. But for whatever reason, Moshe is in a class by himself. The one thing we can say for sure is 
that celibacy has never been advocated as a Jewish mode of spirituality. Moshe Rabbeinu was a unique category. It does not apply to anybody else. All the great Mekubalim, the great mystics, right, were married, the Arizal, etc. There was no notion that you're holier if you're, if you're celibate. So that's Avera number two. Avera number three is that Nadav and Avio used to paskin halacha in the presence of Moshe and Aaron. When people would ask them, Mishayla, ask Moshe, Mishayla, Nadav and Avio would kind of give the answer. There's actually a halacha that you're not supposed to paskin in the presence of your Rebbe. Right? It's not respectful. Uh, in fact, that, that's not only true if they ask the Rebbe, it's even true if they ask you. Meaning, if somebody asks you something and your Rebbe is there, you have to say, you know, please ask my Rebbe. Unless your Rebbe gives you permission. In fact, that's what smicha technically is. Uh, when, when a person is ordained to be Rabbi, what that really means is he is given permission by his teachers to answer halachic questions. Otherwise, he really shouldn't answer uh, if his Rebbe is around, even if it's not in the same presence. So smicha is essentially permission because otherwise it's disrespectful. Nadav and Aveyu didn't have that proper respect. So that's what, that's the third Avera. So I mentioned uh, drinking wine, not getting married, uh, and the third one was uh, paskining halacha in front of Moshe and Aaron. Uh, the fourth one kind of overlaps, and that is in their heart of hearts, they were saying, when will Moshe and Aaron die so we will take over. They saw themselves as the leaders of succession. Right, so that was number four. Number five is an interesting one. They were not wearing all of the big day kahuna. Right? A Kohen has to wear a special uniform when he does the avoda. This is extremely important. This is not optional. If a Kohen does the avoda, and is not wearing all of the proper big day kahuna, the whole temple service is invalid. Not only that, by the way, even if he, he's wearing everything, but he adds something, if he adds a scarf or a necktie or whatever it is. So the avayda is puzzle either if you're lacking garments or you have extra garments. And they were lacking garments, so that's number five. I'm losing count, I think it's number five. Huh? I, no, this is number five, right? Lacking garments. So let me just mention six and seven just so you'll have a, a list. Uh, number six was that in reality they were already Chayav Misa from the day of Matan Torah, the day of Shavuos. How does that work? In Parshas Mishpatim, which is describing the day of Matan Torah, so there's a scene of the youth, the young people, were sitting and gazing at the Shekhinah. And it says they saw Hashem, whatever that means, and under his feet was a sapphire brick. They gazed at the Shekhinah. And they were eating and drinking, which can either mean physical food or soul food. And Chazal say, they were chay of Misa because they were gazing at the Shekhinah and they deserved to die on that day. But God did not want to mar the joy of Matan Torah. So their death was deferred to the day of the dedication of the Mishkan. I have to admit that I have a lot of difficulty with that. I mean, you don't want to kill them on Matan Torah Day because that's a happy day. You don't want to mar it. Well, the day of the dedication of the Mishkan is also a happy day. I mean, if you want to avoid killing them on a day that's happy, then do it the day after that. But this is a chazal, that they were chay of Misa all the way from Matan Torah because of gazing at the Shekhinah. Now, the final interpretation was that in reality... All of Aaron's children should have died in the sin of the golden calf. Because remember, Aaron was very instrumental in making the golden calf. In fact, Aaron made the golden calf, or at least he threw the gold in the fire. 
out of which the calf emerged. Now, of course, Chazal tell us that uh, Aaron's intention was absolutely for the sake of heaven because he thought uh, he would delay them. He thought they wouldn't give their gold. Right? He said, give me your gold. He figured they wouldn't give it. And then by that time, Moshe Rabbeinu would come down. So again, we'll assume that Aaron's intention was totally good. But Lamaisa, he was the architect, so to speak of the golden calf. And because of this, he and all four of his children should have been wiped out. Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer saved two of the children, Elazar and Isamar, and Aaron. So it turns out that Nadav and Aviyu died on the day of the Mishkan, not because of anything they did that day, but they died because this was the residual gezera of the Cheto Egel, that Moshe Rabbeinu's prayers were able to annul halfway, but not the entire way. So we have no fewer, I think, than seven Averos. And that's in addition to the one the Chumash says. This is quite amazing. Why are Chazal, we don't have time to talk about this, but this is a question to think about. Why are Chazal giving me a whole you know, cornucopia of different sins, when in fact the Chumash says what the sin is. The Chumash says they took a fire that was foreign. They should have taken their coals from the altar. They brought in their own fire, right? So that's an interesting question. That's the reason the Torah gives. And Chazal give us seven other reasons. But this was a truly tragic day. It did uh, not even the video were, were died. They had no children, which means... Uh, all Kohanim have to come, who come from Aaron, they have to come from Elazar or Isamar. There are no Kohanim who come from Nadav and Aviyu. That, number one, they never married, as, as we know. And therefore, there are literally no children, no descendants at all from Nadav and Aviyu. Okay, so, okay, we'll stop here. Have a good, good show. Yeah. yeah I got a question at first again. In another nation, that kind of nation, uh, cu culture that survives without country, gypsies. Yes, yes, yes. What the gypsies uh, do have a certain eterni eternity about them. But I think the difference would be, the difference, <laughs> the difference would be that maybe the gypsies survived, but, but I wouldn't say that uh, they have contributed so much to the world, meaning with Jew yeah. Jews, it's not just survival, it's also contribution and, and significance. But the gypsies are a mysterious people, exactly, exactly where they come from, who they are. Uh, and of course, there are common denominators, I mean, there are common denominators in Jews and gypsies, and that is they wander from land to land without ever having a permanent place. So there is an interesting connection. It's almost as if maybe the gypsies are kind of the dark side of the Jews, kind of thing. The other, you know, the, the negative image of the Jew, you have the, the old, if you remember the old cameras before, digital cameras, you had photographic negatives. So some of the gypsies are the photographic negative of, of the Jewish people in some ways. And they're also hated by everyone. And, and they're, hated. they're hated. That's correct. Hitler, uh, you know, I mean, Hitler's main enemy was the Jews, but Hitler uh, had a campaign against the gypsies as well. He wanted to, to eradicate them. Okay, be well, take care. Thank you for listening to this awesome Air production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.